Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. Remember to hit that subscribe button. Yep, and today we got a lot of information that the Holy Spirit gave us and downloaded into us. So we're gonna try and stick to the script today and get through this quickly yet efficiently. So by accepting the work on the cross, that leads us to eternal salvation through Him. You know, we have made a decision to crucify the flesh and now we need to start walking in the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 16 through 17, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. And so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So when we are sinners, we walked in the flesh. The flesh is anything that the body desires and or is earthly pleasures and Honestly, it goes against what the Word of God tells us on how we should live. You know, these are things that we did whenever we were unbelievers. But now that we are believers, we should change those things. But as unbelievers, you know, we did things that were lustful, like adultery, drinking, smoking. Um, you know, this might offend some people, but also gluttony. Um, and we can back that up um, in Proverbs 23, 21. It says, do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves with too much meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothe them in rags. The desires of the flesh can also be emotional issues such as anger, divisiveness, lying, gossiping, or even fear. It says in the Bible that God does not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of sound mind. We should not be anxious. Paul says that... We should not be anxious for anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind through Jesus. And that's in Philippians. So it talks about several desires of the flesh and people who practice them in Revelation. It says in Revelation 21.8, but the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, the murders, the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, the idolaters, and the liars shall have their place in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Yeah, so earlier, you know, we spoke about fear, that the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, um, but of love and of a sound mind. Um, you know, and then so we obviously, those that are watching, I'm assuming that we are all believers in Christ. But let's go to the abominable because it said right here it says but the unbelieving and the abominable and a lot of times we try to group that just with the unbelievers oh well the unbelievers are the ones who are abominable uh to the to god and that's not completely true because i was looking and in proverbs 6 16 through 19 it says these six things doth the lord hate Yea, seven are an abomination to him. That is, these people who do these things, they are abominable. It says a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and soweth discord among the brethren. So these are all things that are an abomination to Christ. So whenever we look at that verse, all of these people here, they will make hell their home, according to John in the book of Revelation. So a proud look that's being prideful and thinking of yourself Thinking first. very highly of yeah. yourself. And a lying tongue, which is just lying about things in general. Yeah, Hands that shed innocent blood. Murderers, killers, uh, baby butchers. Yeah, abortionists. Yeah. And a heart that deceiveth wicked imaginations divisive, divisive sorry wicked imaginations and so that's thinking things thinking evil and wicked things thinking about murdering people thinking about sexual activities those are what is going on in your mind you know jesus knows your heart and he knows what's going on in your mind so yeah. he knows those that deviseth wicked imaginations yeah. and, and also real quick even also people that uh, wish destruction on individuals. Yeah. They might not visionary, like have a vision of their death or anything like that, but they wish harm upon those like, people. Oh, I wish they would just die. Yeah, I wish they would just go away and they wouldn't be around. Yeah. And what you're thinking is, I wish they would just die. That is wicked imaginations. Whenever you imagine evil things against people. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. It's like running towards 
bad things. You know it's bad, but you just can't help it. You're yeah, just you, drawn to it. Well, you're just looking to stir the pot, yeah. and you're not doing it in a a righteous way. You know, there's 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 a difference between stirring the pot righteously mm -hmm. and stirring the pot unrighteously. And these people here, uh, they're just running the mischief. They're just, they're just looking for trouble, and it's, they're they're not backing anything that they're saying up with uh, biblical truth or godliness. A false witness that speaketh lies. So that's anybody who speaks against someone and they know it's a lie. Yeah, because it says right here, a lying tongue, but then also it says a false witness that speaketh lies. There's a big difference between those two. There it is, just a lying tongue. Like we said earlier, a person just running around lying about anything and whatever. Then there's a false witness that speaketh lies. That means that they literally make up things about, about people. people around them. And they sow with discord among the brethren. So yeah, that's, that's in the church. Yeah, that's if you're going into the church and your goal is... Well, I heard them people say, or I heard that person say, or they just try to stir up problems, or they try to disagree with the pastor on what he's saying, or they, in a non-biblical fashion. And the whoremongers, right? So we're talking about... Y'all know about them. Yeah. Y'all keep your pants on. <laughs> <laughs> the idolaters. And that's just anybody who puts things above anything. Jesus. So it could be anything. Your husband, your kids, your work. It could be anything. Yourself. So be careful what you are placing above Jesus. Don't place anything above Jesus. Yeah. And the sorcerers, you guys, get rid of your crystals and burning things in your house, put good vibes in it, or following the zodiacs or the astrologies or your fortune tellers. Yeah. We gotta quit doing that. And like Justin was speaking about earlier, um, me and him were, the prophets, they get on the internet every single day and they say, oh, I've got a word from the Lord from you. That is nothing more than witchcraft, you guys, yeah. and we need to stop it. It is not of God. Yeah, it's bad stuff. Those prophets, now, there are true prophets yes. of God. These individuals here that get online every single day and say, I have a daily prophetic word for you. Listen to this and you will be blessed. Your day will be blessed of God. You will have money coming in that you have no idea where it came from. And it's just speaking just a whole bunch of junk. They're nothing more than fortune tellers, guys, and that is all witchcraft. And so we got to stay away from those people because it says that there will be many false prophets. They try to say that what they're doing is under the guise of godliness and that they hear from God when they do not at all. Yeah, and the they way, are sorcerers. Yeah, the wages for sin is death. All of these things in these last passages will yeah. result in death of the body and the spirit. And if you're running around doing all these things and you're literally starving your spirit, man, yeah. when we're doing all these evil things, it's impossible for the spirit to be in us, quite frankly. It said earlier that you can't have both. So these things are contrary to the spirit. So you can't have sin and the spirit in you at the same time. You can't be living in the spirit and living in the flesh at the same time. No, no. And, and the people who try to do that, those are the people that are of the church, of the lukewarm church that's talked about. And it talks about Jesus literally spewing them out of his mouth. He made, those types of people make him want to vomit. And honestly, as Christians and the spirit living in us and us walking in the spirit, whenever we are doing things that are sinful, that go against God, it should honestly make us feel ill about it. Like it should literally ail us. Um, we should always be striving to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. But, you know, a lot of these people, whenever they start getting into uh, things and they start making it a lifestyle and there is no conviction there to, with those people and they just continually are living in the flesh, but yet they say they're of God and that they that the spirit dwells in them, um, they really need to check themselves because, like she said, the spirit and the flesh cannot be intertwined together. It's either one or the other. Now we all make mistakes. There's a big difference between a mistake and being sorrowful and repentative and then actually blatantly being disobedient and living in a sinful lifestyle. You know, in Romans 6, 1 and 2, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So what he's saying is, guys, is that if we are going to continue in our sins, then the grace of God is not there for us. It is not in our lives. There is no grace for us because it actually says, God forbid. So that means God is like literally saying, no, if you are going to continue in sin, then my grace is not for you. I, I can't, you, you, you don't, you don't live under the, under the grace of God. 
And it says that we should, it says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul, that was a rhetorical question. He's saying that we cannot. If we are dying to ourselves and dying to the flesh, then it is impossible for us to keep living in sin. And if we are still living in sin, then we really need to get in our word and we really need to check our Christianity and we need to start drawing closer to God and get a repentant heart and start feeling convictions for these things that we're doing. Because if there's no conviction involved, then we need to question whether or not the spirit is actually even living in us. Yes. In Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is an eternal life through Jesus, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yeah. So everyone who wants to take the verse and assume that he's talking about the physical death. He's literally talking about the wages for sin is death. He's talking about your spiritual death. Grace cannot abound if you are in your sin. So therefore, if you were to die in your sin, your wages for sin would be your spiritual death. He's saying that you're going to go to hell because there is no grace in you. Eternal life is offered through Christ Jesus, but we have to understand that the grace cannot abound if we continue in the sin. Jesus died for our sins. The least we can do is die to the sins and give them up for him. He made a sacrifice. We must make a sacrifice as well. So if you're living in your sin, you are legitimately crucifying your Lord and Savior over and over again. And we say that we're Christians and that we love Jesus. Um, How can we continue to do these things that are completely against the word of God? How can we continue to keep our Savior up on the cross? It's impossible to love Jesus and want to keep him on the cross. Yeah. And the thing is, guys, is that we have got to die to our old ways. We must put our hands to the plow and we have got to refuse to look back and take our hand off the plow. Because if we do that, it says in the Bible that we're not even fit for the kingdom. And guys, if we call ourselves Christians and yet we're trying to live in sin and we're going back to our old ways, which means we're taking our hand off the plow, then we're literally, I mean, we're just giving Jesus a black eye. We're not doing anything good to benefit the kingdom or Christ. It's, it's just, we are living in known active rebellion. So now we're going to switch gears here and we're going to talk about what it looks like to live in the spirit. Yes. We should be walking in love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Yes. Jesus Everything came, that is opposite of what we just literally spoke about. Yeah. Jesus came to give us life and so that we may live it more abundantly. When we focus on Jesus, then we begin to bear the fruits of the Spirit. We begin to possessing these qualities that are a direct result of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And all of these qualities will manifest in our lives as we grow and walk with the Lord Jesus. Regardless of what's going on in the world and what's going on around us, all of these will manifest in our life and people will be able to tell who we are by the fruit that we bear. No. And the fruits of the Spirit, they definitely take some time to grow. Um, as you go along your walk with Christ, He's going to show you different ways of living for Him. And we've literally got to deprogram ourselves from the lies of the enemy. So it's not going to be an overnight process. You know, these products, these fruits, they mas- as they manifest in our lives... And we strive to be more like Jesus, and that is through studying the Word of God, repenting, you know, getting in that quiet time with Him. Uh, You know, we uh, start holding ourselves more accountable, and not only for our actions, but also our thoughts. And instead of simply just praying, oh, Lord, will you take my anger away, take my depression away, take this addiction away from me, Um, you know, let it part from me, Um, we need to start actively trying to get rid of these things being aware of how we're acting and what we're doing on a daily basis you know it's a process it's not really a destination we always are having to strive to do better the way that we're going to be able to deal with these things is that we're going to have to give the holy spirit more more control in our lives honestly and we're going to to allow him to shape us so that we may grow to be more like jesus you know producing good fruit it's really important guys that we got to keep our eyes on jesus to bear the fruits of the spirit because if we think that we can do these things on our own and we can just run around and just try to uh, practice self-control our own 
practice temperance, you know, practice all of the fruits of the spirit, the joy and everything else, because, you know, the joy comes from the Lord. All of these things that we, that there are fruits of spirit, they come from the Holy Spirit. We cannot do these things on our own. So we have got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We have got to stay in the word, but we'll go ahead and start with the very first one, love. And it says in uh, 1 John 4, 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So spiritual love is not a feeling. It is a cognitive choice, you guys. Love has been perverted by the enemy and twisted to what the world has made it. Yeah. It's Love is not accepting and tolerating the things of this world. Love is going out and speaking against these things because you don't want people to go to hell. It's speaking the gospel even when it's hard. It's telling people that there is a better way and living the life and showing them that there is a better way because we don't want anyone to go to hell. We want everyone to spend their eternity with Christ Jesus. So we can't allow the world to pervert the love part because yeah, because they have done so horribly. You know, with the whole love is love and well, you need to love thy neighbor. And that means that no matter what I do or what I say or how I act or how I, I conduct my life, that you should be acceptant and tolerable of everything that's going on around us. Not true. God is love, but also with God, there is a call to repentance. There is a call to walk better. Yeah, and there's conviction. Because, yes, and there is conviction. That is all love. Yeah, and love are, does not mean don't convict your neighbor. Love no. means you love them. So if you see that they are steering from God, then you tell them. You love them enough to go to them and tell them, hey, listen, lovingly, you're not lining up with the Bible here, and we have to get you back in yeah, line. Yeah, we, so, can't, we can't love people straight to hell. Yes. So that just that, that makes zero sense. So joy. Joy is the reaction to the work of God within us. In John chapter 15, it says, The fullness of joy comes to those who continue in the love of Christ and obey Him. So we may face all kinds of tribulations in this world, but we know the promises of God. And so we can lean on those promises and have joy in times of persecution and in times of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have faith to know that we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. And we're able to possess the joy because we know the perfect will of God. And we know that He has dominion over everything in our lives. He is the conqueror of the enemy, and he keeps his promises. Yep, he's still on the throne, guys. You know, the next one is peace. It says in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. So, guys, there it is right there. We've got to keep our minds on Christ, and we got to trust in Christ. And with that, we have a peace. You know, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. If our full faith and trust is in the Lord... This produces peace within our hearts. And, you know, and then in a time of tribulation and a time of where they say, oh, well, you should be fearful right now. We should be, there should be a lot of fear involved, uh, which so many things nowadays tell us that we should be living in fear. But we know that through Christ, we don't have to do that. We can live in peace if we keep our eyes focused on the Lord. The enemy will not be able to take our peace from within us. True. In John 14, it says, Jesus says that he gives us peace, not the world. So we got to quit looking at the world to give us peace. We got to quit looking at things that are of this world to give us peace. You know, it says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. All fear and anxiety has got to be laid down at the foot of the cross, guys. That's what it was there for. We are healed both physically and and mentally by the cross. Yeah, you know, Jesus, Christ is, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Jesus, he triumphed over sin and death. He's in control of every situation, no matter what we're facing in this life. So yes. understanding that he has dominion over all situations and the enemy's not going to come in and mess up God's perfect plan for your life. It's, God per it's yeah. God's perfect plan. He's going to do it whether the enemy wants him to or not. So that gives yeah. us a peace that if we are leaning on the understanding of Jesus and we are leaning in his perfect will, then nothing is going to take us from that. The next one is long suffering. Yep, we need to show people long suffering because the thing is guys, that Christ is long suffering with us. Oh, yeah. And we as Christians, we have got to conduct ourselves as Christ-like as possible. We will never be Christ-like, but we need to strive to be like Christ. Uh, we need to not be quick to anger uh, at other believers and be long suffering and help people understand the gospel. You know, this is not just with 
faith and other believers, um, but this is in every aspect of our lives. You know, your family, you know, I know that I got three little kids and my long suffering can be about this long. And, and so I struggle with this literally every day. And I know a lot of us do as Christians, you know, it can even be with your coworkers. You know, a lot of times you go to work, you're in a really good mood and all it takes is within the next 15 minutes, some coworkers doing something and it is throwing off your long suffering. You are not being long suffering anymore. You are ready to go off on this individual. So the next one is gentleness. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let you go ahead. And okay. Gentleness would be like, let's say um, you meet somebody and they're going through something in their lives and they're having a really hard time with it. You know, a lot of times have we heard the old adage, well, you just need to get over that. Or, well, that's just life and, you know, we just need to get a stiff upper upper lip and, you know, buck up, bucko, and just get over it. That's not gentleness. That's not showing gentleness. That's not showing a godlike attitude. Um, you know, we need to handle it correctly and handle these individuals correctly through love and through gentleness. We would talk to them about, about it. We would show them that there are things that they can do to try to better their situation or try to overcome the situation without using the hard, harsh words and back it up biblically. You know, that we can overcome all things. You know, we can do all things through Christ. I will um, say, though, there is a time for boldness. And, yes. You know, in the word, it does call us to be bold. So it's not saying you must be gentle. You can't ever talk against anybody and you just have to make sure that you're just this gentle little, little oh, thing. Oh, no. No, it's no. saying just be kind to other people. Yeah. Give them the ability to grow and be gentle with them as they're growing. So the next yeah. is goodness. And as we grow in the Holy Spirit, the characteristics about our personality kind of start changing. And goodness is often looked at as a quality that you either have or you don't have. You're either good or you're just not so good. And as a believer, we need to strive to possess goodness. Goodness does not come at our own benefit. Goodness is for the benefit of the kingdom. We have to strive to set an example with kindness and live a good life to fulfill the what we are called to be fulfilling in a world full of hate and darkness we need to be showing goodness not for our own benefit but the benefit of the lord uh, it says jesus went from town to town showing the goodness of the father in mm -hmm. acts the bible says jesus with the holy spirit and power went around doing good and healing all that were under the power of the devil because god was in him therefore That's when we have the opportunity let us do good to all men especially unto them who are in the household of faith and that was Galatians 6 10. Yeah. And the next one is faith, actually. Faith. Without faith, we cannot be pleasing to God. We have got to show ourselves as faithful servants to Jesus. We are slaves to Christ. We were bought with the price, and that was his blood. It is no longer us, but it is now about him. It's not our will, but his will. Uh, you know, we must put our full faith and trust into him and believe that he says what will happen and who he says that he is. So his promises are yes and amen. We have to believe on that. When he says that he is a God that he should not lie, we have to believe in that. We have to have the faith that if we accept the work on the cross and live in accordance to the spirit and his will, that we will make heaven our home. So that is a promise that if we accept the work on the cross, we start living for him. We walk, we get out of the flesh mode and into the spirit mode. We start living for Christ and not for ourselves. And we, 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 we quit pleasing the flesh. Then we will make heaven our home. So these are all things that will build our faith. And the only way that we're going to really build our faith truly is to be getting in our word, praying, doing everything that, that the word of God calls us to do. The next one is meekness, meaning that we should be quiet and gentle and be submissive. Mm -hmm. So this does not mean that we should be submissive to man. This means that we should be quiet, gentle, and submissive to our Lord and Savior. Everyone wants to take meekness out of context saying that we should not argue or stand up for our convictions. Not true. No. We are supposed to be quiet and meek to our Father and listen to what He says. And the next is temperance, temperance. or self-control. Yes, it's moderations in your actions, your thoughts, and also your feelings. So that's like the big three right there. It's also, it's, it's just having full self-control over everything in your life. Self-control is very vital and important as a believer's walk with Christ. If we have no self-control and we're running around doing all these things, then it completely just 
takes out every single gift of the spirit or every single fruit of the spirit. This is the bread and butter of them all. If we have this, then all the other ones will start falling into place. It's so important that us as believers that we walk in this. We have to resist the flesh at all costs. We must be able to control our own desires and strive for Christ's desires in our lives. And we can harness our self-control by staying in the word, remaining repentant, fasting and praying to the Lord for guidance. Because so many times, guys, we need the Lord's guidance in every aspect of our lives. I know whenever I get up in the morning and if the kids aren't screaming and running around already, I try to get a little bit of prayer time in. And I always pray for the Lord's guidance for that day in my life because I need it. I absolutely need the Lord to intervene in a lot of things in my daily walk. You know, if we're not living in sin, but let's say we just make a mistake. Let's say that we have a lapse in our feelings and we don't show uh, long suffering and we get angry or we get upset with somebody. So we just had a, a, a weakness moment there. But the thing is, guys, is that if we repent for the actions in that time, the Lord will help you to build in your self-control. So we admit that we're wrong and we ask for repentance and we ask him to help us. And we strive to do better at the same time that we he will help us through this. In Philippians, uh, the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, uh, you know, in Proverbs 25, 28, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, I did. Okay, so go ahead. Also, uh, a lot of people will say that, you know, they're having problems with self-control because temptation overcomes them. He always gives you a way out. Yes. So whenever we have temptation, we need to really lean and press in on that self-control. And in Proverbs 25, 28, it says, He that have no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So we need to make sure that we do not get broken down and we don't go without walls. We need to be strong in the Lord and show self-control so that we are able to defeat the enemy through Jesus. Yeah, because if not, like what he said, we're in ruins. I mean, that's and we've all heard that before. That person's in ruins. Well, that's what David was saying, that... Uh, if you have no self-control, then we're just, we're weak-minded. We have no control over ourselves and we just, we, we can't live like that. And we can't expect that us to live a, we can't expect to live a godly, righteous life if we have no self-control. Yeah. And so that was a quick overview of the fruit of the spirit. And so we must remember that whenever the fear and anxiety, anger, division, enviousness, all that starts to begin rising up in the spirit it can be controlled. We have to recognize it is a lie from the enemy. And the only way to control these things is through Jesus. The only way to produce the good fruit is to remain steadfast in the word, have the Holy Spirit within you, and live in order that would be pleasing to God the Father. We must always keep our eyes on Jesus, be repentative, be submissive, and be praying to the Lord and getting to know our Lord and Savior. You know, it says in uh, First Peter or Second Peter 1 5, it said, And beside this, giving all diligence, add your faith virtue and your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So with ending, guys. We need, if we are walking in anything that is fleshly, now that we are Christians, from what everything that we read and we talked about, we now understand that we cannot take things from the old man and try to drag them into the new man. We cannot bring the flesh and the spirit and bring them in together like this and think that they're going to intertwine and they're going to live together in harmony and unity. That is absolutely impossible and through the verses that we read and through scripture that we have read today um, we have come to realize that that in fact is impossible and it cannot happen we have got to strive to live in the spirit now we are human we make mistakes that that is why we need jesus that's why we need the lord and his forgiveness and mercy that's why we needed the work on the cross to make heaven our home because there's no way we would be able to do this all on our own but we have to submit to, to the Lord and we have to allow him to work on us. And we have to be very conscious of our thoughts and our actions and how we conduct ourselves in public and in private. 
Because, you know, a lot of times we conduct ourselves very well in public, but in private, we're completely different people. And so we need to be conscious at all times about what we're doing because the Lord is always watching. He is always there. And so, guys, let's start living in the spirit and let's get out of the flesh. We hope you enjoyed this video and it helped you get a better understanding between the lust of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. Thank you so much for watching. Yep. Do not forget to hit that subscribe button.